Next curve. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Rethink Podcast. I'm Leonard Lee, Managing Director of Next Curve, and today I have a very, very special guest joining me, Daniel Newman, founder and principal analyst of Futurum Research, to talk about what are we going to talk about, Daniel? Geo- Let's talk about okay. geopolitics. Right. Let's talk about economics. Right. Let's talk about innovation, technology, leadership. Uh, we can talk about anything. Really? By the way, who's the special guest? I'm- it's you. I already said that it's you. Oh. So, yeah. And, you know, um, yeah, I, it's, it's such a dynamic topic, right? Geopolitics. So that's what we'll focus on. Um, but we'll focus on it as it relates to its impact on the tech industry. And so, uh, Daniel, it, it's really great to have you on. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this. It's super cool. Very excited. And, um, you know, usually I see you with your buddy, Pat, uh, Patrick Moorhead. Uh, you guys uh, do a great job on your show, The Six Five. So it's, it's a real pleasure and honor to have you on. Dude, it is fantastic to be here. You know, I like chatting to you. Occasionally, I razz you. I call you up. I don't do it in public because you know I don't want to. I don't want to embarrass myself trying to debate you in public. So I just call you or text you behind the scenes and be like, Leonard, what are you talking about, man? Yeah, no, I'm kidding. Yeah, but no, I know. Um, I know. It's you're, good you're, to be here. You know, it's fun to do this. These kinds of conversations, a little bit less filtered than the the TV networks or the yeah, you know, the the, the podcast. Of course, I I know this is done slightly on demand so i can also make you hit the edit button later if i say anything that i think i'm gonna regret uh no that doesn't happen we 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 go raw <laughs> there's no editing buddy so um hey uh, tell our audience a little bit about uh, yourself as well as uh futurum research and uh all the you know this whole plethora of things that you guys do it's it's actually quite amazing yeah, so Daniel Newman, founding partner, principal analyst, Futurum Research, started the business about five years ago. Uh, we are a fast growing research advisory analysis firm. I'd say to some extent we do some of the same things and to some extent we're, we're different. You know, our organization is quickly growing. We've got about 30 part and full time people inside the organization now, uh, filling an interesting white space, I think, between the mega research analysis firms and then kind of the independent a white space. We definitely broach on some of the the more controversial content topics, uh, you know, technology, leadership, innovation, um, public affairs, policy, um, ESG and and diversity uh, and inclusion. So we kind of cover a wide span. Um, Our analyst team, you know, we always say from chips to SaaS and everything in between. Um, Like I said, over 100 clients now, uh, high tech companies that we work with and uh, really proud of what we've created. Uh, and really, we are sort of a amalgamation of analyst, media, influencer, yeah. thought leader, pundit, author, social media guru. <laughs> um, and, and I really did fundamentally believe that that was sort of what the analyst of the future is, is someone that understands the fact that some of what you write needs to go behind a paywall. But most of what we say these days needs to go out in front because, you know, information is so real time that you yeah. can't wait three or four months to publish your thoughts on the mobile market. You can't wait three or four months to talk about, you know, supply chain issues everything now is in real time so uh, really proud of what we are and of course like I said always enjoy these kinds of debates and and talking about you know real issues at least through the lens of what I feel comfortable saying in public (laughs) okay that's wonderful and for uh, you know our audience probably may or may not know that you're you're uh, you're usually uh, tied for first or second with uh, Patrick right as a top analyst so you guys, you guys are, um, you guys have uh, uh, Patrick. You know, Who's Patrick? Oh, yeah. oh, I should probably throw in. You know, I'm the, uh, I'm the uh, you know, one. co-host of the Six Five. We do the Six Five yeah. Summit every year. Um, uh, we have a Six Five podcast. The only reason I say it's Patrick Moorhead, who you're talking about, yeah. is is my co-host. He's my best friend. He was actually the guy that inspired me to start a research firm, and now we are dear friends and fierce competitors. But usually, we're more, you know, we collaborate a lot. We work with the yeah. same companies and customers. 
Um, and like I said, just like you, you know, we we all vie for that same little mind share of these tech companies, but at the same time, we all offer something a little bit different. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. So uh, today we're going to be talking about geopolitics um, and uh, its impact on the tech industry. And so uh, just so that we have, uh, we present an outline to our audience here. Uh, these are the four things that we're going to cover. Uh, first off, we're going to talk about what are some of the key geopolitical trends that we see out there today that we think are, are having an outweighed influence on the direction of uh, where the tech industry is going. And then we'll talk about uh, what are the technology industry uh, trends that are being impacted and how they're being impacted. And then uh, we'll talk about the implications on uh, trade and the tech industry structure. So, you know, we hear a lot about supply chain. So I know, you know, you'll probably want to jump the gun on that topic, but maybe we can uh, save that for the the third bullet item. That I'll, we'll I'll let you about. moderate, buddy. You moderate. Yeah, I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll okay. reply. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cool. And uh, and then finally, we'll just wrap things up with some thoughts around um, how business leaders uh, might want to approach this tumult this tumultuous time. And, uh, you know, uh, Daniel, maybe you'll have some recommendations and I'll throw in a couple of little uh, pointers there myself. So does sound good. I have no recommendations ever. I'm Don't an smile analyst. too much. <laughs> You're recommending things all the time, man. So um, <laughs> let's get started. Okay. Otherwise, we're just we're gonna. All right, let's go. Rock and roll. There we get started. Okay. Rock, rock and roll. And roll. It's Friday. So, Friday. Let's yeah. All right. Let, let's let's start with this first bit. Okay. Which is what are the technology? Uh, you know, what are the uh, geopolitical trends that you see out there? I mean, it, it's a crazy time. I'm sure that. We're going to have some similar thoughts here, but why don't you why don't you share your thoughts? And uh, if you're missing out on anything, I'm just going to kind of fill in the blanks. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, listen, we are in this really interesting um, impasse right now where we've come out of a multi year global pandemic that has pulled forward the innovation, the adoption of technology in some cases by months, in many cases by years. Um, we've saw markets pull forward. Um, on future earnings and we're now seeing a lot of contraction and retracement on that because we we are a, a, an incredibly emotional uh market that doesn't yeah. really root itself in fundamentals as much as we like to tell ourselves that yeah. uh we've got war we've got uh inflation we've got interest rate um implications uh, uh the risk of stagflation We've got strong employment, but a lot of underemployment going on. Uh, we've got China and Taiwan, which is equally as problematic as Russia and Ukraine, even though people don't yeah. necessarily realize that right now because the, the stakes are even higher. We've got an ambition for energy independence, but we've got a really no plan to actually achieve that here stateside. Um, in fact, with you can look at the two parallels of what we've done with the semiconductor market and what we've done with the uh, energy markets, and we've done the exact same thing. We somehow outsourced the entire thing and we've left ourselves completely vulnerable with no real way to handle a conflict at any scale. And so there's a, if, if you wanna use the war analogy, we're fighting on a lot of fronts. And while I do believe the United States continues to be the leader in innovation in many categories, right. uh, has an amazing track record and propensity towards providing the next generation of technology uh, and being core in leadership in both SEPs and uh, in, in different root, rooted of innovation. What we don't have is a plan to handle all these different geopolitical uh, and macroeconomic forces that are happening concurrently. And of course, I'll end with one thing, Leonard. We have perhaps the most polarized partisan system on the planet right now where we've gotten to a point where we can't even be reasonable anymore because we're so rooted and stuck in our political views that we can't even see a rational middle ground and it's it's super harmful it's been destructive through media through social media and now decent people are no longer able to communicate in a normal way so i'd say there's a couple things going on <laughs> Okay, so that's the end of the show. <laughs> Did I hit it all? Did we cover it? Uh, I think you kind of hit it all there. So I mean, there's let's... a lot of depth. We can go deeper. Yeah. On okay. Things, so right? if I were to ask you to pick a top four, um, so this is what yeah. I get when I have you on. Let's pick. Okay, let's, now pick I know. let's pick what's related. Yeah. So okay. Let's talk about the impacts of of our supply chain. Let's talk about. Um, 
I, you know, I think we could briefly touch on the implications yeah. of Russia, Ukraine, and yeah. how enterprises and businesses are handling the situation. I don't want to get yeah. too into the other parts of it, but I'd like to talk yeah. about that. Um, let's talk about inflation and and uh -huh. and how the markets are going to handle that. Yeah. Um, and then maybe you know something fun like what's ahead for tech or what's the the what, what's sure. exciting you know because so, everything else is yeah. kind of sad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, so so uh, you're kind of boiling it down to the four things that I th or the you know three plus one things that I thought uh, think are also important. So the U.S. China tech you know trade war whatever you want to call it or uh, difficulties <laughs> that's a nice way of putting it the russia ukraine situation um, you mentioned china and taiwan and the other thing that i'll throw out there i don't know how much we'll talk about it but there there's a new south korean president uh and so it's uh it it, it throws an interesting dynamic or um, you know it could be a monkey wrench but it definitely injects some interesting uh, nuances uh, in, into the geopolitical situation in uh, APAC. so you know as it relates to the US as well as um, China so uh, cool I, I think there's a lot of alignment that would be the only thing that I would add and it's a recent thing right and it hasn't been really spoken about much so yeah so let's let's jump into it then let's let's go with this first thing and, and you know okay um, uh, the US China uh, tech trade uh, situation your thoughts there well, let's, you know, be candid. It's not just U.S. China, but I would say the broader implications of of decades of outsourcing our yeah. our, our, our tech supply chain yeah. and the potential risks and what that has meant to us. I think as a society, this is not really new. There's been mentions over years of the implications of outsourcing. And by the way, right. from a capitalist point of view, it was brilliant. You know, you cannot knock the fact that these people look at their responsibility to return to shareholders and made decisions based upon that. So there's these, yeah. it's, it's, it's opposing forces. The challenge though is we got so good at just in time. We got so good at building this, this real time supply chain that what we forgot to build in is for the fact that what happens with a disruption when you have a supply chain where you've got very minimal sourcing options, when you've decided to do all your sourcing into one or two markets. And we actually discovered that early in COVID when they completely shut down factories in places like China and Taiwan right. in order to right. temporarily try to slow down the spread of COVID-19. Right. And so what we realized is that there was no alternative routes. And depending on policies put into place by different nations around the world, you know, like the US, we never fully shut down. We didn't. You can say we did. And there were some draconian measures taken in certain locations. But largely, we we were an economic first approach to COVID. It was keep the factories open, quote unquote, essential workers. Well, in other parts of the world, that was not the approach. The approach was complete isolation. And so we couldn't get our phones, we couldn't get televisions, we couldn't get computers, we couldn't get servers, we couldn't, you know, things that we were used to being able to get. And then on top of that, we had a supply chain that had no idea what the long tail of this was. So right. what, what Leonard does this mean in terms of ongoing demand? The automotive industry had no clue. They completely botched the demand and set themselves back years in terms of, of demand. Um, other companies, companies that you and I mutually know well, this yeah. fabulous semiconductor, they were able to more quickly pivot and understand this, the, the, the shifting forces, demand for PCs, the stay at home trade, and they were able to get production going and they, they had some supply constraint, but largely they actually had great growth throughout yeah. the pandemic. But on the other side, we saw almost 37% of semiconductors were manufactured in the US going back to 1990. Right, and right, right. The, the data point, you know this, but I'm just for the audience sake. Yeah, yeah, no, no, we're, we're down to about the audience now, right? So we're down to about 12 percent right, of this, right. and all of what we do manufacture here in the United States is a uh, lagging edge. We don't do any leading edge here. We have a few leading edge fabs in development, yeah. but largely yeah. TSM, Samsung, yeah. uh, Intel. What they're building here is is all on the lagging edge. So we basically outsourced our entire leading edge in the vast majority of our lagging edge overseas and now we have no resiliency well during this pandemic we learned a it takes years to actually fix that you can't just turn, i mean it's hard to even change process in an existing fab let alone spin up a new one yeah so now we've got very few options 
We've yeah. got a high dependency on China. The geopolitical thing is China has a claim to Taiwan that is constantly in the background to say what could this become if you look at what putin is doing with ukraine there is a similar type of belief going on there with xi jinping that there might be some level of 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 access we'll call it to taiwan that he believes china is entitled to and with our dependence on tsm um for the vast majority of our chips and plus some of the others that are located in taiwan plus assemblies and other parts and pieces that are located throughout that region any conflict in that region would be exponentially more devastating than what we've already dealt with. And so the only choice we have is to bring back manufacturing, which is going to take years. And financially, with our unions and with different labor issues here, it's not that easy because you can't get the labor prices, you can't get supplies, materials. So it is a huge mess, Leonard. And and by the way, if we had like four hours, we could keep going, but I'm going to stop there. Well, I I think you can keep going. (laughs) But you get you you see where I'm going. I can tell you've been you've been dying to get on my show here, so it's it's wonderful. Well, you know, it was uh, it it was either Squawk Box or you, and of course I chose you. Yeah, of course, of course, this is the best show. (laughs) No, I I mean I can appreciate all of that. I I think a couple of things that I would throw out there is this: is yes, um, we've had uh, decades of globalism. You know, it started off with multinational uh, multinationals, and then eventually this broad broader strategy, a deeper strategy of, uh, you know, globalization and global companies that just basically uh, comb the planet for the cheapest labor, right? And so um, the way that we are, uh, the, what we're seeing here with the the uh, electronics industry, so, you know, not just focusing on semiconductors, but the broader electronics industry is that that supply chain is predominantly in Asia, right? And so, you know, I think a lot of that pull happened initially with Japan and then eventually South Korea. And then uh, about the the late 80s, you started to see South Korean companies invest in Vietnam very early. In fact, I was there in the uh, early 90s in Vietnam uh, and Samsung was there. LG was there already making a, uh, you know, some beachheads into these uh, low cost uh, manufacturing um, uh, you know, markets and uh, labor markets. And, and of course, in, in China, right, where everybody heard about what was happening in the Guangdong province. And, you know, we saw the rise of Shenzhen, which, you know, just 30 years ago was a, a fishing village. People don't realize that. Right. You, if you go, to, you've been to Shenzhen, right? I haven't. No, you haven't. No, no, no. I need really? to go. But I, I never made that track. Oh, wow. Uh, OK, so when you go, just be prepared to have your mind blown. Uh, but the, the fact is, is that area used to just be a fishing village of no more than like, let's say, 30,000 people. And it, it, it it's um, grown very quickly into what it is today, which is this massive, uh, you know, metropolis. And um, and so, you know, a, a lot of the supply chain that um, we're dealing with in the electronics industry, the broader electronics industry, it, it has, yes, been um, kind of skewed toward uh, the greater Asia region. Uh, and, 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 you know, we've seen that with uh, the European electronics firms, right, whether it's Philips or what have you, a lot of their supply chain um, uh, start to migrate to Asia as well. And so I, I think now the dilemma that we have is uh, because of the pandemic, I mean, I think that was a bit of a, I mean, it was a crisis. It was an unplanned crisis. It impacted everyone. Um, it, it, it did expose some supply chain challenges, but, you know, I think one of the things that we still have to deal with is the fact that structurally, undoing uh, a lot of what has been built in over decades uh, is going to take a a tremendous amount of investment right and so when we start then focusing on semiconductors um, there's a lot of nuances that we need to talk about uh, and consider especially policymakers as as well as our industry leaders so um, I just I just wanted to add that on top of no, what you've explained uh, so eloquently and so uh, in, in such detail. 
Yeah, well, there's a, I mean, there's a lot going on. And of course, yeah, it's crazy. We've heard from Pat Gelsinger, the company's yeah. plans to build the super fabs in Ohio and, and fabs in Arizona and New Mexico yeah. and, and, yeah. and the companies plan to build in, in Europe. And I mean, so we're hearing this just, I think what the market sometimes doesn't understand is it takes years. This is going to take yeah. years to spin yeah. up. I mean, you know, we're all saying, turn this pipeline on and do this to get the oil. And it's like, these things do not happen overnight. Yeah, and overnight, this is overnight. exponentially longer yeah. than that <laughs> in terms of the process here. So yeah. the, the real thing, I guess I'd say the recommendation to the market policymakers that would listen to this is we have to get out in front of this. Like this cannot be reactionary. Our entire world, whether it's from business and enterprise to war is going to be run on compute. It's not yeah. run on, it's not run, you know, you're not going to be, most war is not going to be the way we think of it with people. I mean, it's being fought with cyber crime and cyber hackers, security, biological weapons and distribute. I mean, we cannot run our world on air. We need chips, yeah. we need semiconductors. And so we have to fix this problem. We have no cars, no computers, no servers, no cloud, no data center, no applications. Yeah. This is paramount, but it's sometimes worrisome to me that the policymakers are so far from really understanding the implications of this. Yeah, and I think you're hitting on a really important point because there are a lot of gaps. And one of my observations that I've seen a lot of these policies evolve, um, there's a lot of commitment to big amounts of money. But in terms of what is being expressed as far as policy goes right there's the spend then there's the policy the actual detailed um details of the policy i, I find are pretty flabby um i don't know what how what you've seen i know that you're really involved with a lot of this stuff daniel but flabby is about the best term i can use uh and i and i think it uh, there's there may be uh, and no offense to the CEOs out there, maybe too many CEOs getting involved in the policy making, maybe too few, um, you know, let's say um, uh, arm's length experts uh, providing more holistic perspective on what, uh, you know, what a good policy might be. Because I think um, uh, some of this is uh, some of the policy may be a little bit too slanted toward a, a let's say, a nationalistic isolationistic type of slant when without due consideration for some of the risks that could uh, uh you know really start to become issues if there isn't a thoughtful policy that's put in place you know and, and i think it boils down to debate i mean we're doing a little bit of that right now which i think is super important you know what i'm saying yeah no absolutely you, you know you bring up a lot of good points Globalism isn't a bad word. Um, and despite the fact that a lot of people want to put that slant, or like you said, you got a right left thing, right? You know, you got the left saying as global as possible, the right as nationalistic as possible. And I'm, I'm generalizing and excuse me, because we only have moments to talk about this. Yeah. But my point is, I think it's okay. I always say, you know, charity starts at home. And so yeah. the more, uh, you know, foundationally uh, yeah. sound we are as a nation, the more we are able to contribute and help the rest of the world. Yeah. And so having our stuff in order, meaning having enough supply, not, you know, and again, this oil thing is a great example of what it means when you, you, you know, I look at it as we should be running these two things in parallel. Our desire to yeah. go to renewable shouldn't be directly impacted by our desire to continue to have the uh, amount of of oil reserves and, and access that we require you you're 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 continuing the the old and you're tapering while you're building the new and that's like any good business knows this you build the new innovative business concurrently with the you don't shut yeah. off the, the business that's been your success that feeds it but you know like when microsoft was pivoting from you know being a uh license to a cloud company they didn't just say nope never gonna sell another license they kind of said over this period yeah. of time 
We're going to shift for new customers coming in. We're going to make it lucrative for you to go where we want you to go. For our existing customers, we'll continue to renew. But in four years, five years, 10 years, we are going to ease you off of this platform into this platform. You know, we don't have infrastructure for autonomous vehicles at scale. With just the number of Teslas we have on the road, when I've gone out in a Tesla, I can't get on a supercharger fast enough because there are too many Teslas, not enough infrastructure. And what I'm saying is, and we're early days. When we sell eight times, 12 times, 16 times, you know, Kathy Wood may be wrong about a lot of things, but our infrastructure is lagging and that investment is gonna have to be made if we're serious about moving to um, oh, renewable yeah. resources at scale. So again, we went from semis to renewable, but the the, the foundation is the same, Leonard. The foundational problem yeah, yeah, about yeah, the way yeah. we think is, yeah, is yeah, the yeah. issue. Yeah, and, and yeah, I, I totally agree. I think infrastructure is key. There's always this talk about 5G being the the platform of innovation and such, and but we have to get the networks um, up and running, and we have to advance the maturity of these networks as well, right? I, I mean, um, the, the infrastructure is, is very, very important, and, uh, and uh, making sure that we're doing the proper investments. We're making the the right decisions. I mean, again, going back to policy, there there are important considerations there because strategic things like five G, right? And uh, some analysts are going to kill me for saying this, and I know one particular who's going to probably poo poo on me right now for saying this. But you know, getting getting five G based networks, um, you know, down right in terms of investments and policy as far as spectrum goes and you know uh, making uh, you know uh, abetting and supporting the the um the, the industry i think is going to be really important um because it, it's not entirely the case that in the u.s in particular we've gotten things right um we've done a lot uh, you know um, there's been a lot of mistakes that have been made so um but you know one of the things that i think we we need to also be conscious of, about as because you know i you're right there's not anything intrinsically wrong with uh, globalism but you know definitely we need to get our house in order part of that is going to be we need to uh, modernize our uh, economy um, i'm not quite sure that we we have a plan for doing that but on the flip side uh, there is this bifurcation that seems to be happening at the global level around uh, things, uh, especially related to um, technology standards, whether it's this work that the 3GPP does or, you know, uh, Risk Five, for instance, on the semiconductor side of things, right? Uh, that those things um, could, those efforts, those decades long efforts could be at risk if, uh, if um, you know we dismiss um, you know some of the the um, the the globalization um, the benefits of globalization, and I think a part of the uh, positive outcomes of globalization have been things like the work that the three GPP has done. Yeah, I mean standards are important, and obviously the protection of innovation, the protection of yeah. the innovator, is very yeah. important. Um, you know, next week, I'm actually going to have a, a conversation with Kirti Gupta, um, chief economist at Qualcomm. We're yeah. going to talk about this ahead of their leadership uh, event uh, in, in D.C. I mean, you know, the desire to create demarcation between technology and policy and equities and all these things is merely created to give swim lanes for businesses to function and operate. But the fact is, is these things are are uniquely interdependent on one another. Um, global leadership is like the front that we are fighting a war on. I mean, you know, you want to know what China is most envious of in the U.S.? I would generally say it's the innovative innovation ecosystem. But of course, they're aggressively building world class companies. Um, Tencent and Alibaba, 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 Alibaba. <laughs> and, you know, these these companies are world class. Huawei, I mean, of course, Huawei's had its issues and and uh, related to security and such. But what I guess I mean by this is, you know, fast follow is a real strategy. Um, and of course, when you can build infrastructure and, you know, they're selling base stations for 20% of the price of what Nokia and Ericsson are able to deliver them for at scale, that's how you get infrastructure deployed in, in um, you know, emerging nations that want to make big investments that want to take their dollar as far as possible. So 
you know, we often talk about, you know, um, innovators, implementers. Uh, we talk, you know, about hold up and hold out and what's going on in these cases when it comes to patents. You know, the, the idea here is that there are companies that make big investments in, in the future and those big investments need to yield big returns. We tend to understand it when a venture capital company does, a venture capitalist invests in a startup and gets 20 or 100 times return. But we have this weird philosophy when it comes to companies that spend billions of dollars on research for something like 5G, uh, deploys it to market, but then we're mad and we feel sad for a company like Apple because they have to pay something to actually put those that technology into their devices that they're selling at 80% gross margin. Uh, and 80, by the way, maybe isn't the exact number, but a ridiculous margins with almost no cap into retail. Um, and, and stuff like that kind of disgusts me. So there's the global fronts and then we're fighting the war on our own turf because in the end, everything's about the markets. Why do I spend time focusing on the markets? Because in the end, it's all about return to shareholder. It's all about money. And, you know, I hate to be as cynical as that, but this is what drives everything is power and money. And that hasn't changed. So I sound cynical. I get it. But I'd be it'd be hard to argue that it's anything else driving any of these decisions. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a practical perspective. I, I wouldn't no. characterize it as cynical. Yeah, and um, I, thank I, you. I, yeah, I've, well, you know, I'm, there's nothing intrinsically cynical about that. I, it it is what it is. Is kind of the way I I look at it. I really appreciate your perspectives and uh, you're taking the time to uh, sit down with me here and uh, chat about. Um, you know the geopolitics and uh, its impact on the tech industry uh, i'm sure we're going to have more opportunities to debate this in the future uh really appreciate again appreciate your time and uh hey why don't you uh tell our audience how they can uh get in touch with you um you know how they can uh tap into the vast resource that is futurum research yeah, so check out our website at futurumresearch.com. I know pretty straightforward, but F-U-T-U-R-U-M. Uh, you can check me out on Twitter at Daniel Newman UV. Um, I am the second uh, uh, verified Twitter name under Daniel Newman because there is a actor that was in, I think, um, Vampire Diaries. He was a Calvin Klein model, also named Dan Daniel Newman. As you can tell if you're watching the video, I am neither uh, an actor or a Calvin Klein model, um, but uh, definitely love chatting there. I spend a lot of time on Twitter, a lot of time, um, you know, building out future and research. Love to, uh, you know, stay in touch for any of you that are interested. But definitely bring any, 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 you know, negative comments. Just send them to Leonard, and you know, he'll pass them on. <laughs> well, I'm sure there's going to be nothing but positive. You know, I, I I rarely get any negative stuff, so you're safe with me. Okay. Um, so, hey, thanks for joining um, me on this uh, Rethink uh, webcast. And, uh, you know, to our viewers, thanks for joining us. Uh, please subscribe to our YouTube and Apple podcast channels and visit us at www.next-curve.com. Subscribe to our site and you'll be notified when we publish new articles and great content like this webcast today with... Daniel Newman of Futurum Research. Thank you so much. See ya. Visit us at www.next-curve.com.